Well, welcome to this video. And what we're looking at today is evidence and how we know things. Now, I appreciate this video is not for everyone, so I'll give you the bottom line on it. There's been quite a lot of dodgy publications related to COVID-19 over the past couple of months. Therefore, some of the thought, some of the things that we thought we knew might be based on less than thorough evidence. So that's the bottom line of this, really. But it, it is interesting to look at how we've got here and, and what's going on. So for years, I've used journals like The Lancet, British Medical Journal, New England Journal of Medicine, Journal of the American Medical Association as definitive sources. So if something was in there, that, that was it. That was like a slam dunk. That, 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 that's it. It's in there, so it's true. But it, it appears that I've been a little bit naive over the past couple of months in, in accepting that. And I want to look at why that is. And uh, it, it is very interesting. But before we get around to that, I just want to give you a little bit of background on this on this topic. So how do we know things? You see, in science and medicine and nursing and whatever it is, any of these systematic studies, we rely on the quality of our publications because that's the only way we know. And then we can argue about it. So it looks like there's been a few uh, questionable publications lately. So, so let's look at a bit of the background to this. So Dr. Sackett was the guy that originally started this idea for evidence-based practice. How do we know it's true? Otherwise, we'd be still in the era, era of bloodletting and things like that. So how, how do we know it's true? So that, that was, this is called the evidence-based medicine uh, approach, EBM, that Dr. Sackett started. Evidence-based medicine. Now, how do we know it's true? Well, what he identified was levels of evidence. How sure are we about this? So he came up with these five levels of evidence. So that's level one, two, three, four, and five. And they're written in Roman numerals. It's just the way we traditionally do this. So how sure are we? Well, the gold standard is what we call an RCT, a randomized controlled trial a randomized controlled trial so in a randomized controlled trial what you have is you have an experimental group here so this is the group of, 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 of people this is this is the uh, this is the, the the experimental group who get the in who get the new intervention whatever it is so so that's the experimental group but if we give 100 people in the experimental group a drug and 90 of them get better. What does that tell us about the drug? Well, not much because without the drug, 100 might have got better. So we have to have a, a control group that are treated in the same way. But don't get the new drug. They, they normally get a dummy pill like a placebo or something or whatever the treatment is. So we, we need this experimental group and we need this control group. So what we could do is we could put all the men in that group just to make it convenient and all the women in that group. But of course, there could be reasons why men and women respond differently. So we need the same number of men and women in both groups. Then we could put the young people in that group and the old people in that group. But again, can you see that could mess up the results? So we need the same number of old people and the same number of young people in that group. And then we need the same number of smokers in that group as in that group. And we need the same number of people with past medical history in that group and that group. Can you see you end up, we need the people with same racial characteristics in both groups. They need to be the same. Can you see, to, to pair like with like, there, there's hundreds of characteristics about people. Are they diabetics? Well, we want the same amount of diabetics in both groups. Otherwise, we're not comparing like with like. And it turns out human beings aren't capable of doing this. The only way you can do that is by random allocation. So if someone comes into the trial, they're just recruited into the trial. Will you take part in this trial? Yes, I will. Then they go to randomization and then they're randomly allocated to one of these groups. And it's only when they're randomly allocated that the two groups contain the same profile of people and we're comparing like to like. So without this element of randomization, we get this uh, so-called selection bias. So this is why it's so important. So randomized controlled trials are the, are the gold standard, the gold standard. And then if we find out that 100 people, 100 people enter here, and in this group, um, 90 get better and go home. And in this group, 80 get better and go home. Can you see that means that that's probably doing something? 
because we're comparing like with like and 90 are getting better and going home there whereas only 80 are getting better and going home there so so we know that's true because it's randomized and we've got the two groups to compare and then we'll, we'll get results from both groups so you'll get a set of data from that group and you get a set of data from that group and then what you'll do is some sort of statistical analysis to compare that group with that group and that will tell you the magnitude of the difference between those two groups so th this is just the absolutely standard way that this is done randomized controlled trial now an exception here is a meta-analysis now a meta-analysis is is where you take uh, results from many trials and can recombine all that data so if you had a trial with 100 patients there and 600 patients there then you would put those together and make it so it's like making a trial of 700 patients gives you bigger numbers so that's a meta-analysis so to have good quality data good level evidence level one is a meta-analysis or randomized control with clear cut results randomized controlled trial uh, so that's the best evidence level two evidence would be a small randomized controlled trial with unclear results level three evidence will be a, a cohort now a cohort is a group or a case con case control study so that means you're recruiting a group and you are comparing them with a control group but you don't have the randomization so for example the other day we looked at a study with uh, hydroxychloroquine and it wasn't a randomized controlled trial it was basically at this level it was a cohort so they'd recruited a cohort who weren't randomized they were selected by their doctors for treatment and there was a control a control group who didn't have that medication and were able to compare the two but it's a level three uh, level three level evidence it's not as if it's a randomized double blind controlled trial um, so that's the third level of evidence fourth is historical cohort case controlled so this is looking back to things that have happened in the past retrospective groups and again it's case controlled and in fact that chloroquine study you could have argued that it was in this group because it wasn't retrospective so that would imply that was a uh, no that, that would imply that was prospective looking forward whereas this was retrospective looking back so it, it's this is what we've done over the past few weeks now let's try and make sense of it so not good quality evidence actually and then the poorest quality evidence is a uh, uh, case series studies with no controls which are poorer quality now when we take these levels of evidence as to how we know things these can be transcribed into practical recommendations. So uh, an A-level recommendation would be strong recommendation with level one evidence and consistent finding. In other words, that's based on a meta-analysis or a randomized controlled trial. So that would be good. Strong recommendation to put that into practice. B-level evidence would be recommendation level, which is levels two, three, or four so that, that's levels from two, three, or four type evidence, but consistent. So the results are consistent. They consistently show this approach works, that this, a drug, this, this drug works consistently. C, level C recommendation would be opinion. So there's evidence, but the evidence could be inconsistent because experts often disagree. And D level would be uh, level five evidence with no systematic empirical evidence no evidence from real life empirical real life studies so basically these level of levels of evidence transpose into these levels of recommendation so given that the studies we've been looking at are largely three and four level of evidence then that, that's kind of relating to basically this kind of level of clinical recommendation so you know it's it's hard to give definitive information from the sort of studies we've been getting uh, compared to this gold standard, which has been the, the standard for years. And in, in the past, um, if a study was not of good quality and was not peer reviewed, it simply wouldn't get into these high quality journals. But it turns out over the past few weeks, this has not been the case. So really what I'm saying is we have, a, we have a, an epistemological problem here. We have a problem related to the nature of knowledge, that there are gaps in the knowledge. Now, the knowledge before was very good because the, the, there's established principles of how you look after poorly patients, of course. 
There's established principles of, of uh, public health, of course. These things are already established and can be applied into the new situation. But studies specifically on the coronavirus, the novel coronavirus, are, are lacking. And I'm going to give you the evidence for that now. And, and that comes from the British Medical Journal. Um, so this is research on COVID-19 is suffering imperfect incentives at every stage is this article published on the 28th of May and don't take my word for it look it up so they talk about this problem of site bait now site of course is short for citation so everyone wants to be cited the whole point of being an academic is that people cite your work Campbell 2018 strongly recommends that you know that, that academics got off on this kind of stuff you and me know it's a bit pathetic, but, but um, that, that's, that's kind of what happens. They like these citations and they like to be cited in other people's research. In fact, the scales for this. So academics will go on the computer and say, oh, how many citations have I had? How many times have I been quoted in papers written by other people? So it's all a bit of a, well, it's all a bit of an ego thing, really. But of course, it, it's linked into money because this idea in academia is publish or perish. If you don't publish papers, you don't get money because very often research grants and uh, funding is awarded according to what has been published and the quality of what's been published, even although that can be a bit subjective. So everyone's after these citations. So kind of a lot of academics now kind of want to get onto the co co coronavirus bandwagon because it's flavor of the month. So they're just bashing stuff out there. And the journals, likewise, they want to get stuff out there as well because the journals need to be cited and need to be credited. So we've got this uh, cite bait as opposed to clickbait. And that's a bit of a problem. And this does apply to scientists, but it, it particularly applies to journalists. So scientists will say something. And to be fair, the scientists, scientists might write it in sort of fairly speculative language. So um, I, 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 I've talked to a few journalists and, and they'll, they'll say, well, and they'll send you back something to check and they'll say, uh, you know, it, 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 John Campbell states that. Well, it's just not the way that you would do things scientifically. You know, I much prefer to say John Campbell tentatively suggests that it may be worth a consideration of. You know, scientists do talk tentatively, but journalists like it in hard facts, which now to be fair, there's hard facts about some things, but many things there's not hard facts about. And because this is a novel virus, we are limited for hard facts. So journalists can often say things out loud that, that scientists were kind of thinking, really. And of course, we could add politicians to that. It's even probably worse when politicians get hold of it. At least journalists will do some checking of the story to try and make sure it's correct. So uh, journalists are reporting on more preprint studies. Now, preprint studies studies which are just bashed out there now people are always sending these to me they're saying look you've just said this but this study says this but these are preprint studies they're not yet peer-reviewed they're not yet accepted by recognized journals very often they're preprints they're just bashed out quickly now i know we need to bash things out quickly because it's a new situation and we need to take measures now but it doesn't alter the fact they're preprint studies that are not being peer-reviewed and uh, to say they vary in quality is the understatement of the month. Some are absolute rubbish. There's good stuff there as well that will go on to be peer reviewed, that will go on to publish. So basically peer review, if, if I, a peer is someone who's equal. So, you know, I, 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 I've published some research reports and things. And what happens is you write it up and then it goes to someone who's supposed to be your peer anonymously, some other academic, and they say, well, this bit's good. And they'll send back a report and it actually gets on your nerves because my last publication, I had to change bits. You know, I thought it was good, but this bloke said change it. To get it published, you had to change it. Or this, this lady said change it. I don't know who it was because it's, it's anonymous. Um, so I had to change bits. But, but that's the way the scientific process works. So it's not just me. It is someone else checking it. And then, of course, it's open to further checking once it's been published. So a lot of stuff's being published without being peer reviewed. So... Basically, it's kind of someone's opinion of what they think they've done. So it varies in quality. Uh, this, this, this article says, what we are seeing is a worrying sign of compromise in quality. 
And if you look at this article in the BMJ, this is all neatly referenced. It is a very well written article, actually. Um, worrying signs of compromise in quality. And I have to say that this extends even to the gold standard journal. So you'll have heard me say, well, this is a very reputable journal. And, uh, and it, if I'd been making videos last year, that would be the case. But there does seem to have been some compromise in this site bait race at the moment. There is this problem in the quality of, of what we're, we're getting. Um, there's an urgent need for data and knowledge, but so false information is worse than no information. So yes, there's an urgent need. We need to know stuff about the current virus. But false information is worse than no information. So I think that's such a vital point. False information can actually send you down the wrong way and you can start going in the wrong direction. So what evidence does this, uh, this article in British Medical Journal give for this? Well, so far, the group that they're referring to have reviewed 2,181 2 publications on the novel coronavirus, on COVID-19. So 2,118 publications, but only 304 of those were primary research. Now, what this means is you have primary research and you have secondary articles. So primary research means that me as a researcher, I go out and I collect the data. It's going straight from the real world to me. That's primary research and I write that up. But if I write up what someone else researched, then that is a secondary source. So what this means is a lot of these articles are secondary sources. The people that are doing the writing haven't even gone out and collected the data themselves. They're just writing about data that someone else has collected. Interesting. Getting a little concerning already, to be quite honest. Sometimes this is called cut and paste journalism. So only 304 of those were primary research. That's 14% were primary research. So that's 14% of that. Now, 218, which is 72% 70, of the primary papers, were observational. Were observational. So 72% of this 304 were observational studies. They were observational. And remember, the observational studies are not the double-blind randomized controlled trials the observational studies are kind of uh well what is it is it is it is it cohorts yes case controlled yes but they're they're most of them are actually retrospective they're actually looking back at what's already happened so i think that this observational study i reviewed on hydroxychloroquine for example last week is at that level i think that i think it's at that level pretty low quality evidence actually and if it's level four evidence then at best that can be a, a recommendation and at uh, worst it's uh, opinion so not not basically it means we're kind of working off low quality evidence um so, um, but only 82, only 82 of these studies, 27%, were peer reviewed. So of the, uh, of the 304 primary research papers, only 27% 20, 20, of those were peer reviewed. 27% peer reviewed, that is, that is bad. So in other words, 73% or something were not peer reviewed and been through the brain of another scientist or doctor. Therefore, 3.7% of all publications are peer-reviewed primary research, if you do your sums on that. So 3.7% of the publications are properly peer-reviewed and are based on primary empirical research. And a lot of those are at the observational level. Now, back in February, the World Health Organization was saying there's all about 80 trials going on in China. But so far, the, uh, the publications from that have been um, 
somewhat disappointing in many areas. So we are getting better Western data now, but we are not yet having, we haven't really had time for the proper, uh, for the proper trials that, that we talked about. Um, so what we need, according to this article, is greater transparency. Now, they gave an example here. Neil Ferguson's group, uh, Imperial College London, they published data at the start of this lockdown. And I have no reason to doubt their data analysis was not first class. I've therefore no reason to doubt that their conclusions were not first class conclusions. But we had to accept their word for it because it turns out that the computer code they were using was not a sort that could be shared with other researchers. So ideally, they should have said, well, here's all the raw data. Um, we'll email that to you. You crunch it and see if you get the same results. That couldn't be done because of the way that Imperial had uh, computerized their data, apparently. So, as I say, no reason to suspect that their analysis wasn't spot on. But it would have been nice if a, if a Harvard team had checked that or a team from Sydney or somewhere had checked that. To, to make sure the quality of the data or the, the way they'd crunched the data, the way they had extrapolated information from the data was accurate. Because data's only numbers, that's just ones and noughts. It's, it's, how, the, it's how you make sense of that data in terms of developing inferential and uh, descriptive statistics. That is the important point. And we just had to take their word for that. Whereas if they designed this with greater transparency in mind in advance. And I'm not saying there's anything dodgy going on here. Absolutely not. Not, not. not saying that at all. But it just shows it's an example of the way that teams can work together. Whereas a key way that we're going to get out of this pandemic problem is uh, international sharing, international transparency and uh, international collaboration amongst, amongst researchers. So... Um, all researchers need to think, how can I make this as transparent as possible? How can I release my original data so it can be analysed and interpreted by other teams around the world? And of course, that would make it more amenable for incorporation into meta-analyses as well. So um, that's basically what I want to say on this. But let's just um, remind ourselves about this. So a trial, people entering the trial, voluntary they're randomised, they either go into the experimental group that gets the new treatment or a control group that gets treated in exactly the same way in every respect but doesn't get the particular treatment. They are the control group. So if this group are getting drug A, this group gets a placebo, they don't get a proper drug A, they'll get a dummy tablet, so they think they're getting drug A. Or they won't, actually they don't know. They're told, they're told it's a trial, so they don't know whether they're in that group or that group. And, and what that means is, if the patients don't know whether they're in that group or that group, then the patients don't know. In other words, the patients are blind as to what group they're in. And this is vital. The patients are blind as to what group they are in. Because if the patients in the control group knew they were in the control group, they would think, oh, I'm getting this new scientific sophisticated treatment. And uh, that, that bloke in the other bed across there, well, he's, he's just getting a sugar pill. He's, he's getting rubber. He's getting nothing. I'm going to do much better than him. And that's what you call a placebo, a, a placebo effect. So if I'm getting a treatment and I think it's going to make me better, that will give me a positive placebo effect. And that can make you feel better. So when we give painkillers, for example, when, we, when I give morphine, they reckon that in morphine about 70% of it is the effect of the drug and 30% is the effect of the placebo. So I'd like my patients to have the full effect of the drug and the full effect of believing that the drug is going to work. So if I go to the patient and say, you know, I'm giving you this morphine, mate, but to tell you the truth, that doctor who prescribed it there is a bit, is a bit thick, actually, and um, it's not really the right drug for you. But any, anyway, I'm going to give it anyway because he's told me to. So roll up your sleeve and I'll put it in for you. It probably won't work, but I'm doing what I'm told. Now, if I do that, the patient will still get the effect of the drug, but he won't believe it's going to work because I, think, I don't think it's going to work. So if he believes it's not going to work, he's not going to get the placebo effect on top of the pharmacological effect, on top of the pharmacodynamic effect. 
But if I say, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, you've got some pain. I tell you what, this smart doctor has prescribed just the right drug for you. And, and I've been given this for years. I'm really good at giving it. And I'm going to give you that now. And um, we're sorry you've had pain for so long, but we really know and believe this is going to help you. And this is the best thing for you at the time. This is really the best thing that we can do. Then the patient's going to think, whether consciously or subconsciously, oh, that, that's good. This clever doctor's prescribed me the right drug and this clever guy sticking this right, this correct drug in my arm and isn't, isn't this all wonderful? So then they get the pharmacological effect and they get the 30% placebo effect on top. They get both. That's what you need to do. But conversely, if someone was in the control group here, then they might think, well, you know what? I'm, I'm in the control group here. Well, this is a bit rubbish. I was hoping to get this new sophisticated treatment that's probably going to save my life or help me. But I'm just getting this dummy sugar pill. That, you know, I'm, I'm not very happy about this at all. And, and in fact, the, the treatment I'm getting could even make me worse. So, so that not only that, does that, do those people not benefit from the benefits of the placebo effect, they can actually make the, the treatment, they can believe that the treatment makes them worse. That's called a nocebo effect. And the nocebo effect actually actually works. So if people believe that something's going to harm them, so if you give someone a poison, if you give someone some sugar rather, or j j just something inert and say, well, that was a poison actually. Now, if they really believe you, it'll make, it'll make them sick. That's called the nocebo effect. This is how witch doctors stay in business. They say, oh, well, I'll put a curse on you. And because people believe them, the nocebo effect can make them sick. These are powerful effects. So can you see it's so important that we want to get rid of nocebo effects and placebo effects. So the patients mustn't know what group they're in. And that's what we call blind. The trial has to, So the patients in there are blind to, to which group they're in. The patients in there are blind to which group they're in. So it's a, it's a, it's a RCT, it's a randomized controlled trial. And ideally it's blind as well. And ideally the doctor's assessing the outcomes here and here. The clinician's assessing the outcome there and there. They shouldn't know who was in what group either until they've done their assessment. Because if the clinician's assessing them, say, well, this person's in group A, so he's probably done better, then that could influence the thinking of the people doing the assessing. So ideally, or, or, or if the assessor thinks, well, this person was in the control group, the, the bound to have done rubbish. So I'll mark them down a bit. So it's also important that the assessor doesn't know which group they're in. And that's called double blind. So blind is that the patients don't know. Double blind is that the assessors don't know. It's all coded. So, so, so that's the ideal, the randomized uh, double blind controlled trial, the RCT. And at the moment, we're very limited for that. So at the moment, um, data um, is kind of mostly down at the, the opinion level of recommendation. It's, uh, we, we need more definitive trial data. And there has been this sort of uh, knowledge-based epistemological problem so far in, in, uh, for anyone, really, who is analysing this outbreak. And I must say, um, I have been somewhat guilty of this. In fact, I've been guilty of this. I've been accepting uh, the prestige of the, the academic journal, which, to be fair, has been right for the last 30 years I've been doing this kind of stuff. And yet at the moment, they seem to be open to compromise, which is, is a problem. Let, let's hope the quality of this uh, data that we're getting increases quickly. And let's hope that all researchers opt for maximum cooperation and transparency as we fight this pandemic together.